Uh, this is uh, machine learning in R. So I'm going to talk a little bit about machine learning. And then, uh, time permitting, I'll do, some, uh, do an example or two in R for fun. And um, this is actually the third innovations that I've talked about R. So I did one two years ago, sort of an introduction just to R, and then uh, one last year on using R for bootstrapping. So, so I guess I'm becoming an R evangelist or something, something like that. So um, the, the next part is <clears throat> just to give you some um, motivation for why even be concerned about machine learning. This article from um, Computer World says 12 IT skills that employers can't say, can't say no to. And look at the first one. Machine learning. Okay. The next one is from a little more recent article. Top 10 uh, in-demand skills for data scientists. And the number one is machine learning. So even if you're not in IT, it's a good area for data science, big data, all that stuff. Plus, even if you're just a researcher type, it's a good, good skill to have. All right. So that was just my motivation to uh, suggest why you might want to pursue some uh, interest in machine learning. All right, so here's a picture of an evil machine <laughs> learning or trying to learn about classification of this flower, right? Classification is one of the issues in machine learning, and the example we'll do has to do with classification. But this is a, a, a nasty machine, right? Kind of a fierce-looking machine trying to do some uh, learning. So in my presentation, I'm going to define machine learning, set a context for it, where it comes in, uh, talk about the relationship between machine learning and data science and explore machine learning with a real-life data set. I'm going to do that in R and demonstrate some of the capabilities of R for doing machine learning kinds of things. A little. Certainly won't even scratch the surface. <laughs> All right, so here's an old definition of machine learning <laughs> from 1959. Machine learning, field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. It actually grew out of AI, artificial intelligence, and um, there really isn't a, a truly accepted definition of machine learning. But what we're trying to accomplish in machine learning is to get the computer to do what you would have done. So if you look at some facts, some data, you would react in a certain way because your mind can process it. So in machine learning, we're trying to get the computer to do the same thing. By the way, the term machine learning is also called statistical learning in some circles. Okay? But I use machine learning because it seems closer to uh, computers. All right, now there are two basic types of algorithms that are used in machine learning. Uh, one is called supervised, the other one is called unsupervised. The supervised is where the algorithm has the right answers in it. The data has the right answers. Uh, so for example, if we had a list of prices of houses and we were trying to predict Okay, well, I've got this house now for this amount of money. How much, can I, um, how much can I sell for it? So the answer is already in the data. You see that? The next type is the unsupervised, what I would call mining, you know, like in data mining. In the unsupervised, we're working with data sets that don't have answers in them. For example, when you do a search on Google, that is, first of all, it's machine learning. Secondly, it's unsupervised because 
those algorithms are looking for a pattern. So when you type in, for example, a news story or something as what you're looking for, it has to find things that are like that. And it also has to update itself, I don't know, a million times a day? How many times do people do a Google search? Millions of times a day. All right. So those are the two categories. Um, also, another example, social network analysis. When people use Facebook, and it figures out, well, you know X, and X knows Y, so I can connect Y and you together. Okay, that's the, uh, that's the same same idea. It's, uh, it's unsupervised machine learning. Okay, so lots of examples of those, and I think from these two types of examples, you can see why machine learning is number one. For one thing, we've got so much more data today than we've ever had before. And it's not just that we have so much data, but it's increasing at a rate that never existed before. So every second, there are millions and millions of new connections created on Facebook in uh, searching on Google. Yes. The, the, uh, right, and the same thing happens, for example, on Amazon when you go in and you're looking for something and they may suggest other related things or alternative things. Yes, they're, they're looking for the patterns. So that's under classification, classification analysis. So yes, with all this data, we need to make some sense of it. And it seems as though machine learning is a good way to do it. All right, so the, the distinction isn't really that important. I think it's, the, the, you'll see the words supervised and unsupervised machine learning, but I think it's better to think of it in terms of uh, training and mining. All right, so let's go to data science. <coughs> and uh, this is sort of a fun definition of data science from Mike Driscoll, who's a well-known name in, uh, in the field. He says, data, data science is a blend of Red Bull-fueled hacking and espresso-inspired statistics. So it was kind of a clever play on things, right? <laughs> I like the definition. And here's a, here's a machine, a nice machine, learning, right? Reading a book. He's a nice machine. So where does data science fit in the context of things? This is Drew Conway, and uh, he's a noted data scientist, and he developed this Venn diagram, and we can talk about it for a few minutes. So in the Venn diagram, we have the intersection of three areas. Right? The first area is sort of math and statistics, which you would expect. The second area is substantive knowledge. Substantive knowledge would mean like um, someone in marketing knows marketing. Somebody in education knows education. Somebody in nursing knows nursing. And then hacking skills. Well, I don't know if I would agree with that term, hacking skills. I think it would be better to say uh, computer programming skills, some of which might include hacking. So the intersection of those three things is where the, skills, the, the skill set, the, the domain is for data science. And inside, where things start to overlap, here we have data science, and this whole thing is machine learning. So some of machine learning overlaps with data science, and some of this stuff would be traditional research. So uh, machine learning is part of data science, and uh, data science is really a, a composite of three domain areas. And I think that's, that's a good way of looking at it. Any questions on that picture? Because you, you may not be familiar with the term. Or, uh, data science also sometimes goes by, is used interchangeably with the words big data. We talk about big data, data science. They're kind of the same thing for practical purposes. All right. So 
that was sort of the background stuff to the machine learning and data science. And now what I want to uh, move to is an actual example where we'll look at some data and do some things. Here's a snippet of data from the data set I'm going to look at. And what I'm going to ask you is, look at the data set, or at least the subset that's here, and can you guess, can you tell me what data set this is? It's from a real example. This is not made up numbers. This is from a real example. Can you, can you divine, <laughs> can you use your mental powers to figure out what might be the source of this data? So on the top, we have the different fields. And this is only part. There's, there's a lot more data. I'm just giving you a couple pieces here. So those are the fields. What do you think this data set might actually represent? No, but you're in, you're in the right area. You're thinking travel. No, you're, you're in the right area. It's, it's travel. It's a famous thing. It's very famous. As soon as I say it, you'll say, oh. <laughs> no. Yeah. Accidents, travel. <laughs> It's the Titanic data, right? Do you get it? Some of the, some of the things may not make a lot of sense, but survived. <laughs> yes, no. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we're going to be looking at a real data set uh, from the Titanic. And um, <clears throat> I think I no. Let me, let me just quickly go through what some of the fields are. Uh, survived is whether they survived or not. <laughs> Zero means they didn't make it. One means they did. Uh, P class refers to the, uh, the class that they were traveling. And I think there were three, three levels or three different classes. Sex, age is obvious. The next one, S-I-B-S-P, that means siblings how many siblings or parents they had. They were traveling as a family or not. And then uh, the next one is uh, parents and children, the fair, the cabin, and where they embarked, Southampton or wherever it was. Mm -hmm. um, OK. <clears throat> so that was the route, right? They were going to leave from there, there, there. And that's where the nasty stuff happened. <laughs> it's where they sort of met their fate. Um, now, let's see, is this going to work? Never know. What's that? Yeah, movie. This is original fo uh, footage. I don't know if the, uh, do the speakers work in here? Because there is something, some kind of music. Don't know if the speak. I don't know how the speakers work in this room. I don't know. Anyway, that's the captain. <laughs> Checking out the ship before they sail. Looks pretty good. <laughs> you can see it's old, old footage. I didn't take this footage, by the way. <laughs> I just got it off of YouTube. <laughs> Emergency telephone to be used in case of storm. How ominous. There's the phone. <laughs> Engine room uh, signal chart. That looks reassuring. <laughs> First cabin promenade deck with view of the lifeboats. Boy, that's eerie. <laughs> was this put together before? Just went this was taken before they sailed. And, and you mean Jack was yourself? They had these little different chapters? Yes, yes. They edited it, they edited it afterwards, <laughs> sure. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Right.
third cabin, promenade deck. Uh, loading passengers' baggage by means of electrical crane. I guess that was a big thing. Forward, forward end view of first, second, and third cabin decks. The level of the cabins became important in terms of who survived. Bon voyage, thousands madly cheering as the giant vessel begins to move from her dock. And it shows you a little picture of the, look at all those people. That's unbelievable. Tugboat taking them out. It was a big ship though, <laughs> certainly by the standards of the day. You didn't hear the music, but. <laughs> oh, and by the way, I've, I've never seen the movie Titanic. <laughs> Have, has everyone here seen it? Am I the only one in the room that's never seen it? Probably. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I gave you a look at some of the data at the beginning. I'm going to give you a better look at the data. And then we're going to examine the data. Because what are we looking for? Well, we're looking for patterns. Let's see. We're trying to figure out if there were any particular things that would, have that would be a good indicator of whether somebody survived or not. Um, <clears throat> now, one of the things I asked you to do when I presented the data was to try to divine and figure out what the data was of. That would be a classical machine learning problem in itself. You'd give the computer a, data, a set of data and say, well, is it this or that? For example, um, spam filters. Spam filters all in email uh, all use uh, machine learning because they have to look at the email body, pick out certain words, certain relationships, and then make a decision, spam, not spam. <laughs> right? So it's the same kind of thing. So machine learning is very, very pervasive. Now. Let me, let's see. Well, I'll do these first, and then I'll go to the data. Uh, we'll come back to the data. This, this is just a, a diagram that shows a, a graph of a relationship between the age of the person and the fare. The red and blue dots indicate whether they survived or not. Red dot means they didn't make it. Blue dot means they did. So the relationship between fair and age, looking at the pattern of blue and red dots, would your first initial impression be that there is a relationship between those two things in terms of predicting survivability? 
Would you say yes or no? What's that? <laughs> well, there, there really isn't much of a pattern because there isn't a pattern. <laughs> there are lots of people down here that didn't survive. I mean, there, there weren't that many people paying that many big fares to begin with. But essentially, there is no relationship here. As compared to, look at this one. Now I've, I'm contrasting gender, male versus female, and um, age doesn't really matter too much. But what could you say about the gender comparison in terms of survivability just based on the picture, the chart? The uh, red means they didn't survive, the blue means they did. So females had a better shot at surviving, right? And, and, and that's good, that's correct. I, uh, the, the data, when I say correct, I mean the data supports that, right? So <clears throat> we, mu we will explore that in R in more detail. My machine rule would be uh, if sex equals female, then survive equals yes. Else if the sex equals male, then survive equals no. They didn't make it, right? So if we're going to do machine learning, we need to have a set of rules. <laughs> and this is an example of one of the rules. Now, I guess if you ever looked at any programming languages, you would say, well, this looks pretty similar to uh, a conditional statement in a programming language. You know, no matter what it is. Now, um, before, uh, sorry. Yeah. before making this rule, don't you have the same thing? We'll get to that. Data. I'm going to do that in the next part on R. I'm just giving you the overview now. Okay. Yes, definitely you do. Absolutely. Um, so we could implement this by actually writing a program to look for this and that. And that. Um, we also have the ability in R to test for these types of relationships without writing a program. And uh, it's, uh, it, this is a problem in classification. So we will develop in our, an actual classification tree to help us with this. And as Ali said, we'll actually talk about training versus testing and all that. But we haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> so this is one reasonable relationship to explore. Right? And if we did explore the relationships, there are a number of different metrics we could use to determine how well we did. One of the popular metrics used is called a confusion matrix. <laughs> I don't know why they call it that. It's not really that confusing. Um, so we would look at, if we applied that last rule, if you were uh, female, then you survive. If you were male, then you didn't. Uh, if this is the male and this is the female, then the correct answer for the male would be no, they didn't. We could, we could use our overall rule, and then we could calculate what percentage were actually classified correctly just based on that rule. That would, that would be reasonably straightforward. All right, so now we're going to transition to R, because we want to be able to do something in R. <laughs> And just some quick facts about R, in case you're not familiar with it. Uh, it is a programming language specifically for statistical issues, statistical problems. It's open source, which means it's free. It's flexible. It can be integrated with any of the popular packages, SPSS, SAS, whatever. Um, it has a huge user base, huge, tremendous. and. Um, Remember back in uh, 2008 when we had the big economic dip, <laughs> um, many universities, in order to cut corners, cut costs, did not renew their subscriptions to SPSS or SAS because of the money. I mean, you know, a university like Ohio State or something, we're talking some serious money to get a site license. 
and many of these schools and, and researchers, um, there's a whole list of companies that use R, switched to R <laughs> primarily because it's uh, free, great user support, and all that good stuff. Right? So uh, just trying to give you some background about R. I'm not going to really go into R that much. Um, here are some resources about R, books, plenty of stuff on the internet. <clears throat> uh, if you want to download R, you would go to the uh, www.rproject.org and download it for free. And there are thousands of packages, not just for machine learning. I mean, it does all the basic statistics. It does all the graphing. Uh, the New York Times, by the way, uses uh, R for its uh, graphs because it's so flexible. Yeah. I mean, there are just so many things you can do in R that would be very difficult to do in SPSS. <laughs> and I, I had been using SPSS since 1974. <laughs> so I haven't used it lately because <laughs> I've been doing things in R. <laughs> All right, that's just, you know, something for you to think about. <clears throat> All right, now, as I said, there are lots and lots of packages in R. One of the packages that's somewhat popular for machine learning is called Carrot. <laughs> Has nothing to do with a carrot, it's just a picture. Uh, <laughs> it's not a salad. It's, carrot is an acronym, of course, uh, Classification and Regression Training. C-A for C-A, R-E-T, Regression Training, okay? It's called Carrot. And, um, it can be used for data splitting, processing, um, some of the different models that we're going to talk about uh, you can do in, in the carrot package. And um, this is one of those packages developed and supported by users. <laughs> you know, nobody gets paid to do these things for R. People just do them. And one of the limitations with SPSS and SAS is they typically only update their stuff once a year. Whereas R is updated multiple times a year. New packages are, are added daily. So there are lots of capabilities, especially in data science, um, that are available in R that don't even exist yet in SPSS or SAS. Pardon? Users, huh? I'm, I'm not sure where it was actually started. Um, let me see if we can find that out. No, um, it might be. Yeah, it doesn't say. <laughs> What's that? What do you say? How the machine starts to learn. Okay. All right. Anyway, there's lots of good references. On R, the R carrot package is a good thing to learn. And here's a machine thinking too. This one is actually trying to tune him or herself up for some more learning. Um, here are some uh, resources for learning about the carrot package. Um, there are tutorials and uh, a paper on the package. Uh, uh, another uh, reference for doing predictive modeling in R, because I c couldn't possibly cover all this. All right. And then um, the last part of my slides is, it's not machine learning, it's machines learning. There are several machines here learning, okay? So it's not just one, it's several. <laughs> all right. Let's, I think that was it for that one, yeah. All right, let me get rid of this and go to something else. Going to this. Hmm. Oh, come on, come on. I guess that's as good as I'll get it. All right, so what I've done here is um, I've actually logged into my computer at home because I have all the stuff set up on my computer at home. I'm not going to try to do it here. That'd be a mess. So. This is running on my computer at home, and I'm just presenting the stuff to you, you know, 60 miles away or so to <laughs> see what's going on. So this is the interface uh, for R, and um, I use a program called RStudio, 
to make R a little friendlier, easier to use. And this is actually R being presented inside of R Studio. And R Studio is uh, free. And uh, most of the people I know that do things with R use R Studio because it's so much easier to get around in R. <laughs> All right. And um, we've got uh, some different frames here. I guess we don't have a pointer or anything, electronic pointer. Hmm. We have some different frames. This is where you can, this, this frame here, it's four quadrants. One, two, three, four. You can arrange them any way you want. I just arrange mine this way because I'm used to it. And uh, this one is, will show you the results of R when you run it. Okay, so in other words, this is the output, the, the answer place. This one over here is where you can develop uh, scripts, routines to run and then see what they look like over here. Over here in environment, um, you can look at some data and stuff like that. Over here, this is where you can uh, update your packages. Here's my carrot package is installed and a couple hundred other ones are installed. Um, and some other information. So let's uh, so keep that in mind. Don't worry about that for the moment. Let's look at some data. And um, hmm. let's see. Always a good thing to look at data. Yeah. Um, the, the data files are available lots of places on the internet. Just do a search for Titanic data. You can get the data from lots of sources. Um, I'm just presenting it here in Excel uh, just because I think you'd probably be more comfortable, familiar with Excel than the uh, business in R. Um, and you can see in the data set, the first row, of course, are all the different headings. Uh, the class survived. Well, I didn't include the name in the snippet that you saw because the name is really of little value in this exercise. <laughs> and then some other things like the, um, uh, the ticket number and all that stuff. Um, <clears throat> And if I scroll down to the bottom, yep. So I'm at row uh, 1310, deducting one for the label. So that's about 1,309 records, right? 1,309 records. Now, one thing I'll point out is that um, there is some dispute in the literature about even the number of people that were actually on the Titanic. Because apparently some people uh, booked registrations under aliases. So we don't really know for sure how many unique people there really were on the boat. <laughs> uh, and also, if you were to look more closely at the data, you would see things like this, 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 uh, this, this, missing data. We don't, we don't have that data. We just don't have it. <laughs> so, um, okay. The, so the full set of data here is um, uh, over a thousand records. And uh, <clears throat> one of the, I guess I can get rid of that. Yeah. Go back to, oh. <laughs> go back to R. One of the issues that comes in big data, data science, and this type of thing is that how are we going to, how are we going to verify our results? We're trying to make a prediction based on something. How are we going to verify that we're right or wrong or close or not so close? Well, if you were doing st a traditional statistical research, how would you verify that your hypothesis was correct? Anybody? You would, do a, you would do a statistical test. And you would test at a certain level of confidence, 0 0.05, 0 0.01. And you would get a metric like an F score. And then you would compare it to the probability in the world of getting it. And if it's less than that, then you would say, yes, OK, I can be reasonably certain. Well, 
We can't really do that here. <laughs> we can't really do that here. We can't really test the hypothesis per se. We can do something close. But the issue here, at least the way I look at it, is a little bit different than when you were dealing with something like experimental research. So if you were doing traditional experimental research, if you had 30 subjects, you would be delighted. If you had 100 subjects, you would be extremely delighted. Because normally in research of that type, you don't get those kinds of numbers, right? You don't. It just doesn't happen. Now, with big data, we've got over 1,000 people just for the Titanic data, which is a small data set, by the way, <laughs> compared to searches in Google or spam filters or Facebook associations. So how are we then going to use, sort of leverage, capitalize on the fact that we have all this data to help give us some notion of whether we're correct or incorrect? Well, this is where your point comes up trading versus testing. When you have a large data set in data science, what you do is you break that into two pieces. One is called the training set, the other one is called the testing set. So you would develop your model, whatever it might be, using the data from the training set. When you're satisfied with your model, then you actually test it on real data, right? And that would give us some indication, some warm and fuzzy, about how good we did. Now, we have that luxury of being able to split the data, primarily because we have so much data. You know, you can't do that in experimental research. <laughs> you know, you're, sometimes you're lucky if you've got 12, 12 people <laughs> in an experiment. Um, but we can do that um, with big data. And that's the way it's done, All right? So we divide the data into training, uh, training set and a testing set. Now, um, any, any questions about that? Because that's an important point. Yeah. For the question for R, do you need these data sets to be in the same format or can it handle different unformatted data types? Or? Yes, it can handle uh, CSV, comma, separated. It can handle Excel, SPSS, whatever it might be. Is that what, was that what you were really asking? Yeah, that, I know it can handle those, but does it do any in CSV or you know the fields, what they correspond right. to? Right. If it were totally unformatted or randomly formatted, no, you'd have, to, you'd have to tell it step by step how to convert that into a data frame or a table or something like that. Because it, it has no special knowledge of what those fields might mean to you or to somebody else. So there isn't any way of dealing with that. No, I, I OK. Um, so and do you, does our figure come with packages for all these, or do you have to figure out what you need? And you want? I, I see your script there. You're, you're including some libraries. How do you know you need to? Yeah. Well, some of the libraries have dependencies, so when you load like when I load one of those, it's going to automatically bring up the other, and sometimes it doesn't. I, I explicitly mention them here because I wanted to be clear about them. And I'll tell you a little bit about that when we get into the code. Um, but back to the training and the testing. Um, one of the things that R will help you do in the carrot package um, is it will help you split the data. Okay? It's called uh, create data partition. So you can tell it, OK, here's my superset of data. And you can split it however you want. And th there are some guidelines in the literature about what percentage should be in the training, what percentage should be in the, you know, 60-40 is probably as good as any. Some people use 80-20. Really, it's going to depend upon how much data you have. But in any case, in R, you can specify what percentage of data you want in each. And you can do something else <laughs> that's important. You can specify a seed value and, uh, for randomization. Okay, You can specify a seed value. And if you use that seed value again and again, you'll get the same values in your two sets. If you don't use the same seed value, then you'll get random 
values in your set. So some people like that ability because then they have re reproducible results. Because it will randomly select cases from your big data set and put it either into training or into testing for you. And that's very convenient. <laughs> So after you've divided your data into those two pieces, then you would be ready to think about a model to use, work the model on the training piece. After you're satisfied, OK, well, ready to try it on the real thing. OK? Does that make sense? Because I know that's a little different than the way you know, things worked when I studied statistics back in the 70s. We, know we had hypothesis tests, and basically that was it. <laughs> this whole notion of training set and uh, testing is, is very new, you know, compared to some of the other things that have been around forever. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, one website that is particularly helpful with this, and also a website from which you can make money, is called Kaggle, K-A-G-G-L-E dot com. And I think I'll try to bring it up here. Let's see, is it going to cooperate or not? Oops. All right, here it is. C-A-G-G-L-E, the home of data science. <laughs> uh, they have competitions on data, different data sets in which you're challenged to develop predictions. And um, they give awards and prizes for people that have the best stuff. Now, they give you a training set and a testing set. So they're going to compare all the submissions to the testing set to see, OK, well, who had, for example, remember I showed you in that confusion matrix, percentage correct? Something like that they would use as a metric to say, OK, well, your model was 79% accurate. OK, that was better than anybody else's, so you get the prize. And, and this site has a lot of information on the packages, programming language to use. Because right? you don't have to do this in R. You could do it in a programming language. Uh, what, uh, what programming language do you think is very popular for doing data science stuff? Uh, this is only anecdotal. I didn't go out and count them up. I just, I'm saying this based upon the stuff I've read and seen. Now, <laughs> that's like, that's a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, Co nobody would use COBOL. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, Python. Python is the one. Yeah, it's not Java. I, I, I thought some people would say Java, but it's not Java. It's Python, because Python is, first of all, it's, it's, it's a little easier to learn than Java. Um, and uh, it's easier to learn, and you can do a lot of things with it. One of the things um, I've done in Python, just, just a side note, is I have a, um, a TiVo DVR, okay? And Python has lots and lots of utilities to it. So I have a program in Python that will allow me to take any um, video that I download off the internet and send it to my TiVo DVR to play on my TV. It was very easy to do in Python. And the people that sell TiVo, they can't do it. They don't, they don't do that for their customers. You know? So if you downloaded a video on your computer and you wanted to see it on your TV elsewhere that's attached to the TiVo box, they wouldn't be able to help you. But Python can help you. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's a very, very good language to learn. Uh, modern language. so. You don't have to put up with all the awful stuff from C with pointers and all that stuff, or the hideous things from COBOL with the four divisions and all that stuff, yeah. So anyway, um, this is a great resource uh, where you can learn from other people. They have tons of tutorials like on which packages to use. And it's free. I, I, I can log in because I'm a member. It's free to join. You just give me an email address. And the tutorials are all there, too. Yeah.
To run the stuff, no. To host the data, yes, they, they use GitHub. Right, right, mm -hmm. right, right. That's true. Yeah. Now, you really have to get to some really huge data sets before that's an issue. You know, really huge. I mean, some astronomical data sets might be, but uh, the typical things that they have on here you could do on your home computer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So anyway, this is a great resource. It's got jobs and it's got university competitions and all sorts of things. So, let me get rid of that. All right, so where am I? We talked about the separating the data. All right, so I don't, let's do some things in the last few minutes in R. So the very first line, I don't have a pointer and I can't reach up there, but it's line number one. I don't know if you can read it. Can you read it? You can't read it. It says tra uh, train, and then um, there is a little thing. Oh, that's great. High tech here. Yeah, it is. Well, it'd be nice if it had electronic pointer. So it says that, and then this little symbol is used to take the things that are on the right side and assign them to the values. It's like an equal sign in regular programming languages. So what this does is uh, it uses uh, read.csv, which is a built-in um, library in, uh, in R that would allow you to input data that is in uh, comma separated uh, format. Okay. And uh, I use the, um, uh, what did I use? I use train.csv, that's the file that I got from Kaggle. Okay, it's also in other places, but I just used their file because it was good to use. And so this will read that file and it reads it into this name now called train. So I can use the word train as a substitute for the file. I only have to read it in once. And that's it. So it's pretty easy to read in um, um, any, any formatted file. And there, there are lots of other ways you could do it. Uh, for example, down here, there is a thing, a tab called import data set. If you clicked on that, you, uh, it would say from text file, and then you could open a directory, point to the file you want to uh, bring in, and just say open. And that point and click will actually execute that command. Okay, so you could do it either way. Either way would work. All right, so uh, these are script things. None of these have been executed because you can see that one window is completely dark. There's nothing there. So to make it go, <laughs> all I need to do is highlight the line. And you probably can't see it, but my cursor is flashing anywhere on that line. Beginning, middle, end, doesn't matter. <laughs> and then up here, you say run. And here's, here's what it did over here. It actually ran it. And I don't know if you noticed, but it also popped up down here in data the name of the data set that I have. So that was pretty, that's pretty easy. It's just click, right? And it tells me that in my training set, there are 891 observations and 12 variables. And uh, if I click on it, then it brings up like a little mini spreadsheet over here that shows you all the variables, what they are, all that good stuff, right? So I go back to my R script. So you could look at them after you've brought them in, which is you know, always a good idea to make sure that they did bring them in correctly. All right. Um, then the next line, uh, just doing a sample plot. I don't know if you can see it. It says mosaic plot. That's the name of the package. And, you know, as I said, there are thousands of packages. I don't know every single one by any means. I know a couple handful, so that's about it. Uh, and I'm going to do 
I'm going to execute the mosaic package on the training data. So I just have to use the word train. I don't have to specify the path and the file and all that mess. And then it says train. <clears throat> it says train dollar sign. Is it sex? And then, yeah, tilde, train, blah, blah, blah. Let, I just want to explain a little bit of the notation here. You'll get used to it after a while. Uh, so this is going to draw a graph for me, a particular type of graph, um, in which the, the, um, the column sex, which was in the, the data file, um, is going to be used, this thing here is going to be, is, is sex is going to be predicted by the things that follow it. So the things that follow it are, um, the first thing is whether or not um, someone survived. Do you see that where it says train dollar sign survived? The, the notation in R is, you, you have the name of the object, which in this case is a file called train, and then a dollar sign to separate the object from the names of the columns. So it's always dollar sign, name of the column. All right, so, you know, once you get used to that, it's not too bad. And then the other things here are just some, um, some um, information for the mosaic package. If I can scroll that over. Uh, it's going to give it a title, tell it whether to shade it, tell it what to call the x-axis, the y-axis, okay? So it's going to do some things for us, but um, the, the point of this is a plot that's going to show the relationship between sex and whether or not somebody survived, <laughs> right? So to execute it, just click anywhere on the line and then click run and lo and behold down here where it says plots it gives you a little squeezed up plot that you can't see so you go up to zoom click on zoom and then open it all the way because that's the only way to see the whole thing okay this is called a mosaic plot so on the x-axis we have the sex on the y-axis we have survived uh, zero means they didn't survive, one means they did, and then we've got the male and female. So what, uh, and it's passenger fate by gender. So what does the, remember this is from our training set, this is not from the whole thing, this is just a training set. So what does the, what does the graph, or what does the plot suggest? Yeah, it's, it's, it pretty much hits you right in the eyes, right? So, you know, when I, when I was taking statistics back in the 70s, the professors would have called this the ocular test. Just look at it. <laughs> oh, come on, just look at it. You don't need to know any numbers. Just look. <laughs> All right, so that's pretty clear, right? Okay, so that's just a plot. We haven't done anything else magical with it yet. I'm just going to close that out. Gets me back here. Now, in the next line, I am doing a couple things, uh, and I group them together. What I'm, what I'm looking at in the next three lines is I want to see a relationship between uh, somebody surviving uh, their fate based on age. Now, if you remember from the data that I showed you, there was a column called age, right? But age is a um, continuous variable. It's not uh, categorical. So <laughs> I wanted to define, for my purposes, what I considered a child. So in this line, I created a variable called train dollar sign child. Okay? There is no child field in the table, in the train. I'm actually, by doing this, I'm actually adding that to that uh, data set. And I'm initializing it, giving a starting value of zero. And then the next line, what do you think that does? Train dollar sign child, per, uh, bracket uh, train dollar sign age less than 10, 
equals 1. Any, any guesses what that would do? <laughs> yeah. It, it basically says if, if there is a number in the age field that is less than, less than, ten, less than 10, give it a value of 1. So I'm making it not a continuous variable. I'm making it a categorical variable by doing that. Right? <laughs> All right. And uh, so then the, the, the third line of the thing is, again, the mosaic plot, where now I'm going to do child, which I just created up there, and um, um, whether they survived or not. Right? So you see how flexible that, that is? To I could redefine the data. I could convert continuous data to categorical data and then do a plot on it. <laughs> OK, so running out of time, so let me just quickly do the run. And again, it's going to show it down here. Oops, what happened? Oh, got an error message. Mm, oh, I know why. <laughs> yeah, the error message is, this is, oh, it is, because it's a computer language. Something like that. OK, no, it's good to get this error, because I can tell you exactly what I did wrong. Because you'll probably do the same thing. <laughs> and, I, and I do this all the time. I, it's just a habit. It says, the error message said it's messed up. The reason it's messed up is because I tried to execute line 6, but I did not execute 4 and 5. Just because they're over on the script, they don't get executed until you say run. So that's why it said over here, hey, I don't know what you're talking about. There is no child. So if I go back up, back up to this line, and you can, you can jump around here, it doesn't matter, and now say run, that does that. Now the next line I also have to run, that does that. Now I come back to the line that gave me a problem, try to run that, and there it is down here. So now I'm going to do a zoom, do a bigger picture. Okay, so what does that tell us? that look promising? Now we've got adult is 0, child is 1. Child based on my definition that less than 10. What would that suggest? What's that? Uh-huh. Yeah, looks like that. All right. So if I wanted to test the hypothesis, women and children first, Maybe not so <laughs> on the Titanic, right? Because, well, women survived more, but it doesn't look like children did. So women and children first, eh, maybe not. <laughs> I don't even know if that's politically correct today, but back then I'm sure it was. I'm sure it was back then. You know, when you only have so many seats in the lifeboat, so you have to decide who's going to get in. <laughs> and, the, and by the way, they didn't have enough lifeboats. All right, and then the last thing I'll just show you to give you some idea of the power of R. And I'm executing all these different libraries. Um, the library R part is the library that does a classification tree. Yes, partition. It does a classification tree. And then this uh, rattle and part plot and brewer, they're to make it look nice. All right, so uh, let's see. So I got to X, I'll do this quickly, get you out of here in a minute. So that one ran, and that one ran. I'm going to run this one, run this one, and run the brewer. All right, so now I'm going to run, oh, I wonder if that'll work. Um, now I'm going to run what I'm calling model one. Model one is looking at what? What am I trying to, can you, can you deduce the source code? What am I trying to compare? What am I trying to predict? I'm trying to predict whether they survived based on sex by using a classification tree. Okay? We haven't used a classification tree until this point. Everything else was just plots. So let's see if this will run. Where is it? Yeah, model one. OK, so if I say run, Ew, let's see. 
Okay. I, again, made the same mistake. I didn't run the line that was before it. So I ran the line, this thing here, and then it just shows me, okay, I ran the line. Now I've got to do the fancy thing to make it. This is, this is what uses the um, R Brewer and the part plot. So now when I click on this one, we'll get the classification tree and run. And here it is. So now I'm going to zoom, come up here, and uh, got some things in the way, but it, it drew this classification tree for me. Um, might be a little hard to see here, but the very first thing up here, <clears throat> this represents the division between um, male and female for the entire data set. So the 0.62 means that 62%, when I say entire, I mean the training data set, the one I'm working on, I don't mean the big guy. Yeah. So 62% of the uh, records in the set were male and 38% um, uh, were female, and that's 100%. Now, the next line does a classification based on sex. So uh, male, if it's yes, we go down this way. If it's no, then we're actually talking this is a female, right? Because it's either one or the other, binary, right? So what do we get down here? What does that tell us? What does that tell us? Yes. No, 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 don't, don't get to that part yet. What do the 81 and, uh, 0.1 and 0.19 mean? Right, 0.81 is the zero. They, uh, of the males, 81% of the males did not survive. 19% of the males did survive. Now, over here, what do we have? This, is, uh, this means female, right? So, pardon? No, that means didn't. This means they did. Zero one. It's zero one, right? So 74% of the females survived. Now, this last number, this is actually the voting that the algorithm would do to predict whether or not somebody is going to be likely to survive based on sex. Pardon? No. No. No, it's, it's a voting thing, and there's a whole crazy algorithm to figure out uh, whether or not you. So, what's that? So, so that 65% would mean that it is going to predict, 65% of the males would predict that it's going to No, it's, it means that, um, we can, We can be reasonably sure, and think about the whole data set. Remember, this is the training part. We could be reasonably sure in the whole data set that the majority of males will die. <laughs> but we can only, right, we can only presume that 35% of female patients will die. It's, it's more of a probability than a percent, but it's done by voting, and if you had more categories, you'd get more things. Yeah. So you get the nice graph from the, from the data set. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Partly. If you look at my uh, model two, let's see, no, model two does age. In model three, I have um, three things, right? I'm trying to predict survive based on their class, their age, and their sex. You could have as many of these as you wanted. 
the diagram will become more complicated. All right, so I, I'll show you what this one looks like, because you might, might be curious. And then that, I guess we're out of time. So let's see now, I gotta run this first. That ran, and now I can do the model three, run that one. And then I can do the zoom. Yes, and uh, I think it's coming up behind the thing. I don't know where it is. Nope. There it is. Yeah. Yeah, a few things. <laughs> anyway, this, uh, the, the point is you can add as many things as you want. Right. And, it, and it will develop the classification tree for you. And that's just one of the things you can do in R, because you can still do regression. You could do regression with, the, with this carrot package. You'll do a general linear model with it on this data. You could do that. It's, it's not that hard. Um, it also will do what are called random forests, more sophisticated statistical technique, very popular. It'll do uh, nearest neighbor. So all of these techniques that are not even thought of in SPSS are readily available in R. So that's it.